But today, we're going to talk about climate change and especially how to understand and communicate it. I have three goals for this lecture today. One is to cover the basic science of climate change. So my, the goal there, and by the way, I'm going to make this PowerPoint available to you after class, so don't try to keep up with all the data and stuff like that. So you t type down extra notes of things that aren't in the PowerPoint, but I'm going to publish this as soon as class is over. So one of the goals is to be able to walk out of here and have a basic understanding of climate science if this is the only exposure you get to it so that you can talk to your skeptical dad or grandfather about it, <laughs> right? So that's one of the goals. And if you remember back to my bio at the beginning of the semester, not only was I a working journalist, but then I went and got a PhD in geography speciali specializing in climatology and geographic education. So I'm a journalist and a climatologist. So that's kind of allows me to look at this research in a different way through the lens of both. So the first thing I want to do is try to understand the science. I'm going to go through it a little quickly. It's not going to be in depth, but hopefully it piques some of your interest. The second thing, we're going to look at the research article that you read on television weathercasters as science communicators. And the third thing I want to do is talk about the doubt industry, the article that you read about Exxon at the end, about how Organizations use uncertainty to their advantage, right, to, to deny what is happening with the science. So let's just talk briefly about the science. And I know that you've been exposed to some of this before. And I brought in my handy dandy earth. I've got it all in my own hands. So <laughs> tell me what you know already about the tilt of the earth. I know you studied this in other classes. It tilts around Roughly 20 degree angle. Tell me your name again. I'm Rebecca. Rebecca. So, anybody want to be more precise about the tilt? Chandler. It creates the seasons. It, as Rebecca said, it creates the seasons. Our tilt is 23 and a half degrees from the perpendicular. So, that is responsible for our seasons. So, when I pass the globe around, at the northern hemisphere, the Tropic of Cancer is 23 and a half degrees north. Mm -hmm. And that's as far as the sun travels and is <coughs> parallel to the, to the earth in June on the summer solstice. In the southern hemisphere, it's the Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south. That's as far south as it tracks. That would be our winter and the southern hemisphere summer. Do you know that the tilt is not static? Whoa. Science tells us that the tilt varies over geologic time. It's not going to change in our lifetime, so we don't have to worry about some dramatic shift in plate tectonics. But the range of the, the tilt of the Earth is 21.8 degrees to 24.4. So we're kind of in the happy medium of Goldilocks in terms of the tilt. It could be more pronounced, which would accentuate the seasons. Does that make sense? All right, tell me about the revolution. What is that? Rebecca. Three hundred and sixty-five and a quarter days, right? Remember leap year? So it takes the Earth three hundred and sixty-five and a quarter days to go around the sun. When we're talking about climate, it's all about our relationship to the sun. Okay? So that is slowing down over time. And at some point in way into the future, we won't be here. Scientists project it'll take four hundred and twenty-five days for the Earth to go around the sun. Well, that's going to have some dramatic <coughs> impacts on climate, right? But these things are, and, and the revolution we want to talk about also is, is elliptical, not a circle. So it means that right now we're closest to the sun in January, and we're furthest from the sun in July, and that changes over a 26,000 year cycle. So 26,000 years from now, the Earth will actually be closer in July and further in January, and that's what creates ice ages. I know that was pretty, pretty rushed, right? The idea here is that there are the thing, these things called external forcings. This is how the Earth operates in the solar system. We don't have any control over, okay? These, these are the things that create our climate. And the term noise refers to those are the natural climatic changes that we would expect. The signal refers to can we find a signal of something that's abnormal? In this case, a human fingerprint. So one of the things that's interesting to note is that most of the time of this planet has been spent in ice ages. We're in a 
sweet little window that a lot of climatologists call a climatic optimum. It's been warm enough for life to, to spread. The ice sheets that were all over North America 18,000 years before now have retreated to the Arctic, and now we're actually worried about them disappearing. So we have this nice little window that we get to live in. And if the planet is going to go back into an ice age, I raise kind of a rhetorical question. Why then should we be worried about what we're doing to the planet? And in some cases, skeptics use this argument. It's like the climate has always changed, so why are we even having discussions about the fact that it's changing? <laughs> but there are a couple of key points we want to take into consideration. <coughs> One of them is that greenhouse gases have never been this high in a, a million years. How do we know that? How do scientists know that? That's a pretty amazing figure, right? Yes? So Matt says one of the ways to do this is we can measure the atmosphere by digging deep into the ice core. So that's, exac that's exactly what scientists do. So in Antarctica, we're digging deeper and deeper and deeper, and the wonderful thing is what the composition of the atmosphere is frozen, so we can know the composition, and it's never, we've never had greenhouse gases this high. And one of the things we know about greenhouse gases is they trap heat. So it makes sense that if there are more than have ever been there before, we're gonna be likely to be trapping more heat. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is an organization of several thousand of the world's leading climate scientists. In their 2015 report said, there's an unequivocal human fingerprint on this change. What does the term unequivocal mean? Rebecca. <laughs> uh, you, you can't deny it. Without a doubt. Okay, so they're saying without a doubt, the change that we're seeing is a signal it's the signal of an aberration versus just the noise of the kind of climate change we might be expecting. It's a pretty strong statement from this group of scientists. So this article I had you read from the Washington Post, it's not the most recent story on this, but I like it for a couple of reasons. Did you read this? Yeah, so it talks about that it's reached this worrying milestone now that we cross 400 parts per million. It has some really nice features to it, especially down here at the end, links to other stories that kind of ties in with Robert Quigley's talk on Monday about how you can provide links with social media to send people, send the audience to more resources. So it tells us that carbon dioxide now has reached, has exceeded 400 parts per million. Is that a lot? It's not very much compared to other gases in the atmosphere, what's the most, uh, the largest gas in our atmosphere in terms of percentage? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. What's the percentage? Like 78%. What's next? Oxygen that we need, about 20%. So these are referred to, greenhouse gases are referred to tr as trace gases. They don't make up large percentages of the atmosphere, but they're very effective at trapping heat. That's what makes them important to us. And this article tells us that the greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, are 43% higher than pre-industrial levels. The idea here is we're talking about when did we start to burn fossil fuels, right? 43% higher. And I like this quote in the story. It tells us that carbon dioxide is an invisible threat. If it were something that we could see or taste like other types of pollution, maybe we might respond to it differently, but the fact that it's invisible sometimes means that people don't notice it. And then again, the idea that there were some good links in this particular story. So let's look at carbon dioxide readings. Have any of you ever seen this chart before? So it comes from an observatory in Mauna Loa. Where is that? Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii. Why measure carbon dioxide there? Why not measure it in Houston? Adam. Great, so Adam just told us it's not near what we call point sources of pollution. 
if you've been to the Big Island of Hawaii, it's out in the middle of the Pacific. And the idea is the atmosphere is mixed there. So you're much more likely to get a, a true average of carbon dioxide as opposed to being distorted by being closer to uh, sources of pollution. Describe to me what you see. <coughs> well, how would you describe that if you were a journalist writing about this change in CO2? <coughs> Adam. Steadily increasing over the last 50 years, yeah. And the term for it is linear because it's like a line. Do you see that it's like a line? It's a straight line? It's pretty convincing. Tell me what's going on with the up and down red lines. Emily. Great, so Emily, environmental science major, <laughs> explained it very well. So the high points, the peaks when the CO2 is the highest is Northern Hemisphere winter. Okay, Mauna Loa is in the Northern Hemisphere, which is where we live. And in the winter, the deciduous trees lose their leaves, so they're not taking CO2 out of the atmosphere to photosynthesize, which means there's more left in the atmosphere. And then summer comes and look at CO2 drops because trees are taking it out of the atmosphere to grow. That's why deforestation ends up being one of the most important things related to climate change. As the Amazon and other places are deforested, what's happening is we're taking trees that take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere out of the system. It's referred to as a sink. If you read the article that was posted about the oceans, the oceans right now have been saving us because the oceans have ended up being an, a remarkable sink for the extra CO2. <laughs> the oceans right now are absorbing a lot of extra CO2. We don't know when the oceans are gonna stop doing that. But thankfully for trees, <coughs> they do this on a seasonal basis. So this only goes out to 2010. So here's the most recent one. So the Washington Post article, we were at 400 parts per million, now we're up to 400 and almost 11. So nothing's changing about this linear relationship. Carbon dioxide continues to grow and see the seasonal cycle, winter to summer. So one of the things I like to think about this, one of the weather casters that I interviewed for this research said, what, who says we have to live in harmony with the earth anyway? There's this idea that you know, man is superior to nature. We're supposed to tame nature. When I look at something like this, it makes me think Earth is just exactly like us. It's breathing. There's like an inhale, there's an exhale, there's an inhale, there's an exhale, there's an inhale. It's breathing just like we do. Taking in oxygen, breathing out carbon dioxide. It's a pretty remarkable thing that the planet does. And there isn't anything that suggests that this pattern or this trend is gonna stop or change. So what are the facts? Just a quick page of facts. The Earth has already warmed, and that fancy symbol there is plus or minus 1.3 degrees. The reason there's a range, if you saw in the Washington Post article, is that the way that we've measured temperature has changed, and so there's a little bit of uncertainty, which is gonna be one of the key words of our discussion today. Where is scientific uncertainty, and why does it exist? In the IPCC report, again, this is like 2,000 of the world's best scientists coming together. They conclude that most of this warming that's already happened is, quote, very likely due to humans. Let's interpret what they mean. What do scientists mean when they say very likely? Let's quantify it. Can we? It is a measure of confidence. Dylan? Yes. Dylan. In this case, 95% certainty. Okay, so the scientists are pretty certain. 95 is pretty high, right? You'd be happy with a 95 in this class? <laughs> right? 95 is good, right? It's pretty high certainty. So uh, the world's best scientists are able to say, yes, human beings are culpable in this. And in fact, nearly every climate scientist agrees with this scientific consensus. 
So again, you'll have this PowerPoint, so don't worry about all the references and things. You can go back and check on them. So one of the things that happened was the National Academy of Sciences, under pressure, really to saying there, there's this debate, but well, there isn't a debate. They went back and looked at the literature, and there's really very few scientists who disagree. The people who are skeptical are usually not climate scientists. Now the really bad news is we've already had a little bit of warming, but look at the range of potential warming. So it could be three to nine times what we've already experienced, and that's going to lead to some dramatic impacts. So the second takeaway of why, in answering why should we care about this, is the unprecedented rate of change. This is a very dramatic change, very, very quickly. You and I are probably gonna be okay We'll crank up the air conditioning, we'll do whatever we need to do, but there are a lot of species that cannot adapt this quickly to this kind of change. They literally cannot move fast enough if the climate of where they are now changes this quickly. And we are already seeing that happen. In fact, in my Australia study abroad trip, we go around a mountainside and there's like one of these frogs left in Australia because it managed to somehow survive by moving around the mountain, but the other frogs didn't make it. So the takeaway really from this very quick primer on the science is the only uncertainty in the science community is really what's gonna happen. We understand that this is already in motion. The climate is changing. We, you and I are altering the very composition of our atmosphere, but we do not know what that will mean. We don't know the timing or the magnitude of impacts. And ultimately, that's what people want to know.